we're going to transition and and I wish I could say you know we're going to transition onto a lighter note but it's getting heavy um, you know Jay's story is heavy because sin is heavy my story is heavy because sin is heavy um, we're going to look at a passage today that is heavy and it's all about grief it's about sadness um, a couple of weeks ago, I introduced to you this, uh, this series that we're going to kind of walk through in the Psalms, right? This is the third week in the Psalms. And the prayer church behind this is that we would, as a new church, as a community, uh, as new relationships are being formed, and as we're seeing God's hand on the move, and we're watching the Lord redeem people and work in incredible ways, we don't want to be a church that is getting ahead of God. Do you know what I mean? If you're, I've got a sin, I've got a, a drive to me to where if I'm not careful, I'm I'm telling God what to do. You know, I'm like, come on, keep up, God. Like, we can be that way as a people. And and I, gosh, I want to guard us against that as a church. We're just coming to the Psalms and we're saying, Lord, we just want to pause. We just want to delight in you. And and really, the the phrase we've been saying is encounter God. Let's not get ahead of God. Let's just come to the Psalms. It's an invitation for us to encounter the Lord, delight in His presence, and to pause and just to, to say, Lord, you're worthy. Right? You might not walk out of here every week thinking, well, I learned this, this, and this, but I pray that you walk out every week saying, man, I, 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 taste, I, I could taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You can't do that if you move too quickly. When I was a kid, I would eat my meals very, very quickly, and my dad would get frustrated at me. He'd say, son, you can't even taste the flavor. It's probably true, right? <laughs> but, but church, we, if we're moving too quickly, we're not going to taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, let's slow down. So that's the invitation. This week, we come to a psalm of lament. We did a, pra a praise psalm. We did a thanksgiving psalm. This week, Psalm 88, a psalm of lament. Out of the 150 psalms, the majority of them are psalms of lamentation. Not to mention, we have an entire book in the Bible called Lamentations, right? A book of laments. Because life is hard, all right? And, and we're not going to come in here every week and, and stay down on ourselves, but we also want to deal with the reality that life is difficult. I told Emily this week, I said, sweetheart, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm, I'm a little afraid of, of, of preaching this, right? Because my temptation is to come and to, to try to make everybody happier. And, and she said, babe, our faith has got to be big enough to handle this. And I said, that's exactly right. Our faith needs to be big enough to handle the reality of grief. And quite frankly, our culture does not have faith to handle it. And so we turn to other things, right? So let's look biblically, church, on how we, how we can be sad well, right? How we can allow grief and sadness and sorrow to drive us into the presence of the Lord, into the fullness of God as opposed to causing us to retreat, right? So as we approach Psalm 88 and we see grief, our, we want renewal. We don't want retreat. We want to encounter God. Our culture, as I mentioned, is not uh, a good example for us to follow, right? And, and whether it's parents or outside influences, we all begin to model the things that are most prevalent in our life. And we've got to recognize that our culture is not a good example of how we should process and deal with deep emotions, right? Um, we have a culture that is angry in a lot of ways. Uh, we can deal with anger, but the problem is not necessarily the anger. It's the way that our culture deals with anger. It, it results in violence, right? We see violence unfolding. We have a lot of disagreement in our culture. The problem in and of itself is not disagreement. It's the fact that we don't know how to disagree. We don't know how to do that without spewing hatred and condescending sarcasm toward one another, right? We don't know how to deal with conflict. And so we, we implode, and, and our world is the way that it is because we don't know how to deal with the deep, hard emotions. Psalm 88 will lead us into that, specifically kind of addressing this concept of grief. Grief is the loss of something, the loss of a loved one. Maybe you've experienced that. It's the loss of an idea that you thought would come to fruition one day, but never did. Right? It's the loss of a season of life that that you loved and you wish you could have back. It's the loss of an expectation that, that was never met. It's hard to lose things. Grief in particular is, I would say, extra hard because in a way it begins to intensify 
other deep emotions within you, right? Like grief has a way of grabbing hold of depression and bringing it up or anxiety, right? Or loneliness or anger. Grief, for whatever reason, just begins to stir those things deeper within us. And it becomes unbearable sometimes. That's why the Psalms are such a precious gift to us and what we want to lean into because it allows us to deal with the reality of grief. And it doesn't offer you and I four easy steps to fix your life, right? As if that's even possible. The Psalms is honest enough to say you're a complex, layered human being made in the image of God. And the only one who can actually lead you into healing is God himself. So let's feast on that, right? Your YouTube motivational videos, they're great. They're cool. But they're not going to fix your life. They're not going to repair your soul. But Psalms can lead us there. Psalm 88 is where we'll be. We're going to read uh, together just all 18 verses, if you would, and then kind of break it down as we do to understand, all right? So verse 1 of Psalm 88. It says, Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out before you day and night. My, may my prayer reach your presence. Listen to my cry. For I have had enough troubles, and my life is near Sheol. I am counted among these going down to the pit. I'm like a man without strength, abandoned among the dead. I'm like the slain lying in the grave, whom you no longer remember, who are cut off from your care. Verse 6, you have put me in the lowest part of the pit, in the darkest places, in the depths. Your wrath weighs heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You've distanced my friends from me. You've made me repulsive to them. I'm shut in and, and cannot go out. My eyes are worn out from crying. Lord, I cry to you all day long. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do, you, do departed spirits rise up to praise you? Will your faithful love be declared in the grave? Your faithfulness in Abaddon? Will your wonders be known in the darkness? Or your righteousness in the land of oblivion? But I call to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer meets you. Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? From my youth I've been suffering and near death. I suffer your horrors. I'm, I'm desperate. Your wrath sweeps over me. Your terrors destroy me. They surround me like water all day long. They close in on me from every side. You've distanced loved one and neighbor from me. Darkness is my only friend. It's heavy, isn't it? It's heavy. One commentator said, it's good that we have a psalm like this, and it's also good that we only have one psalm like this. And we do. If you ever read Psalms of Lament, they will always end with a hope in the Lord, and they will always call you back to the hope we have. Not this one. It ends in darkness. The pattern that you and I are used to seeing, though, is... The opposite, right? The movies we watch, the TV shows we watch all end victoriously and triumphantly, right? The guy gets the girl. Uh, the good guy beats the bad guy. The, the underdog team beats the defending champs. And, and we get to applaud. We get to clap at the end. But life's not a movie, right? And again, Psalm 88 is, is honest enough to just recognize that. Uh, it, it knows that you might have a hard season of life, and then right after that, you might have an even harder season of life. Because life isn't a movie. You can't, it's not written on a script to, that it just has this happy ending sometimes. Now, we'll get there, and in Christ there is resurrection, and we'll get there, but Psalm 88, man, it just seems over. Darkness. It's heavy. It brings us into the reality of grief and the, the wrestling match that takes place with God as we experience it. Shouts of desperation, right? Statements of accusation to God. Questions about what in the world are you doing? And sometimes our theology knows the answer to that, but our pain has not caught up to that theology. And so we're left in this disconnect, aren't we? Between what we know and what we feel. And the, the Psalms seek to bring both of those things in. Let's take the truths of God. Let's take the pain and the grief in your heart. And let's bring them together so that we can be anchored in hope. Psalms does that. Let's break it down. Let's just kind of see expressions of grief in this psalm. And again, the goal is not that we walk away with new quick fix steps, but a simply, simply encountering the Lord in the midst of sorrow. And you might be grieving right now. You might not be, but all of us have grieved in the past. All of us will grieve in the future. And that is not some like morbid prophecy I'm trying to put over you. 
you're like, get that evil away from me, Ricky Bobby, whatever. <laughs> but I, again, I care about you enough to remind you that this world is a broken, fallen place. And the Bible promises we will have hardship. So let's be a people that know how to encounter these things biblically and in the Lord. So the first expression of grief I think we see in this text is loneliness. All right, loneliness. Verse 3, he says, I've, I've had enough troubles and my life is near Sheol, this place of the dead. He says, verse 4, I'm counted among those going down to the pit. I'm like a man without strength, abandoned among the dead. I'm like the slain lion in the grave whom you no longer remember. And I'm cut off from your care. Guys, I don't know if there's a worse feeling in the world than feeling abandoned by God. In his desperation, in his grief, he's expressing deep loneliness. He says, basically, I feel as good as, as dead to you, God. Do, do you even value me at all? Again, there's this gap sometimes in our theology and in our feelings, because I think most of us would say, yes, God cares. The Bible tells me so, right? Jesus loves me for the Bible tells me so. We sing it as children, some of us. Yet, for some reason, we can, we can have deep loneliness in our soul and in our heart. Right? Maybe, that's, maybe that's you today. You're sitting here and, and you're lonely. What if I just said, well, stop. Look around. There's people in this room. You don't need to be lonely. Your brain knows that, but your heart doesn't care. We need to get, these, we need to get our pain and our truth synced together. That's what the psalm is, is guiding us to. What you need is not for me to give some logical advice. It's for you to have a God who speaks to it and enters into it. That's what's crazy about the God of the Bible. Not only does He address the pain that we deal with, he actually enters it. Like he doesn't just pat us on the back and say, I'll see you next week. He entered it. Think back to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, apart from the cross, I mean, I don't know if there's a more anguishing moment in Scripture. The Bible tells us that Jesus was in deep anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane as he awaits what is coming. He was sweating blood, um, crying out, pleading with the Father, let this cup pass from me. He's met with silence. On top of that, he's, he's expecting his best friends and his disciples to be praying for him. But several times he goes and finds them sleeping. Have you ever really placed confidence in friends who've just completely let you down? It leads to loneliness. Am I just in this by myself? On top of that, after his friends disappoint him, Judas outright betrays him. On top of that, the one who swore he would be with Jesus, no matter what, Denies him three times, just outright. I mean, that's a lonely feeling, guys. Crying out to God, you're met with silence. You're betrayed, abandoned, forgotten, denied. Jesus is very familiar with Psalm 88. So if you're in that place this morning, right, you're sitting there thinking, man, I'm, I, I'm deeply lonely. I've never talked. I've never told anybody that. I've tried to put the smile on. I've tried to fake it, right? Maybe fake myself into it, but just, it's okay. You can be honest. The Bible is honest enough to be like, hey, that's a real, it's a real issue, but God has entered it. So when you cry out to Jesus in loneliness, you can bet that he knows exactly how you're feeling. He's not just saying, yeah, I'll be there for you. No, he knows the pain. He knows what it looks like. Just this week, the, the U.S. Surgeon General declared, I'm not lying, they declared a, a public health epidemic. Did you see this? Loneliness. That's a public health epidemic. They're saying it's leading to um, heart disease, uh, depression, suicide, anxiety. And in, an, in a way, I'm not, I'm not surprised, right? In the most connected uh, time in our history, we are the most lonely people. We want to be a church that enters that. We want to enter it and meet each other in our loneliness and engage our culture in the loneliness that it is pretending doesn't exist. The psalmist transitions, right, from these I statements. We'll move through these quickly. He says, I am I'm counted among those going down. I am like a man without strength. I am like the slain lying in the grave. And then he transitions to all these you statements, right? It's like it starts to get a little accusatory. There's some anger here. This is what happens in grief, right? It begins to evolve and morph and change into different emotions. He transitions in verse 6. You put me in the lowest part of the pit. In the darkest places in the depths, your wrath weighs heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have distanced my friends from me. Now, did he? Did God do those things? Like, is God responsible for the distance in his friendships? Or is it just because he feels, 
he feels down and he has separated himself. I don't think that's the point. The bottom line is that he feels that way, right? He feels the weight of this, and, and in his grief, he's directing his anger now and his accusations onto God. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had eaten from the fruit that they were not, or eaten from the tree they weren't supposed to, right? And then they, were, they ran and hid because they realized they were naked. God comes looking and says, Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to? And what does Adam say? It was the woman that you gave me. <laughs> kind of like Jay standing up here saying, Yolan. <laughs> he loves you. You know that, right? Immediate blame to the woman and to God. He didn't own any of it. So we have inherited that sin nature. Right? The reason that you and I have such a hard time just kind of owning mistakes is because it is within us to blame everybody else. You're, you might be blaming somebody right now for the way that you are. And my goodness, the way that you are now is because of somebody in your past. But you cannot allow that blame and that accusation and that anger to sit there. Whether it's dormant or not, it will eventually give birth to poison and sin and lead to destruction. The psalmist, his grief, his loneliness has turned into kind of this anger toward God. Pain and grief become so unbearable sometimes, church, that we begin to channel those things in unhealthy ways. And it bleeds out and it leaks onto other people. And, and we want them to then feel the pain that we have felt. You've heard the phrase maybe, hurt people, hurt people. Right? Because some of the ways that we deal with our own pain is to, to say, well, I'm hurting, so I want you to hurt with me. And we think that's going to make us feel better. But all it does is lead to more destruction. There's a band called Need to Breathe, one of my favorite bands. Um, they have a song called Wasteland that uh, I've at times really, really liked. I felt in times of my life I've been in a wasteland, right? Dry season, wandering, wondering what God's doing. So they wrote a song about it. There's a lyric in there. They, they sing in one of the verses. It says, all of these people I meet, it seems like they're fine. Yeah, in some ways I hope that they're not, and their hearts are like mine. You ever feel that way? Like how selfish of that would, that would you to have to be to say that out loud? Like none of us would say that out loud and be like, I'm hurting. Man, I want you to hurt too. I hope you're not okay. But gosh, in the deepest part of our soul, sometimes we just want that. We just want you to hurt because I hurt. It's sin nature. But I promise you it only leads to destruction. When Jesus was suffering in the garden, the weight of what was before him on his soul, instead of turning to the disciples and to Judas and to Peter and criticizing and condemning, just moments before he broke bread with them, knowing what was coming, he sat at a table, had a meal together. Who in your life right now are you blaming that you need to forgive? Are you angry with someone that you need to reconcile with? And you might say, ah, I've forgotten about it. I've moved on. I would say that there might be seeds still planted, lying dormant, that need to be addressed. We need to rip them up so that we can find freedom on the other side. They will give, they will sprout eventually. Let your grief, let your emotions drive you into the presence of the Lord. Let's continue. The, the emotional roller coaster, if you will, moves forward. Verse 9, he says, My eyes are worn out from crying. Lord, I cry out to you all day long. I spread out my hands to you. Uh, it's kind of an interesting little detail that, that didn't really have to be mentioned, but it's sandwiched in between these you know, accusational statements, and then we'll see kind of these mockery questions that he has for God. Just kind of in the middle of that says, uh, I'm worn out from crying. It's like David in Psalm 6 when he said, I'm weary from my groaning, my tears uh, with my tears, I dampen my bed. I drench my couch every night. My eyes are swollen from grief. That's like, I don't, I don't think I would want everybody to know that my couch is soaking wet from all my tears. You know, like that's personal. But again, the Bible includes those, those little details in life. Because we're all, most of us are old enough to realize that there are moments when you could, you could just spend the whole day weeping because of the brokenness and the hardship that exists around us and within us. So the Bible's honest about it. So he, he has that little moment and then, then kind of comes out of it into verse 10. And like this is when I, like if my friend were talking to God like this, I would kind of step aside like, bro, the lightning's coming. 
you know, because this is harsh, man. And, and the, the, this is not like an instruction in how to talk to God. This is just dealing with the reality that you're a human being and you're messy and you've got layers. Did I cut off? Cool. I guess we're using this guy. <laughs> now I can't move. I feel restricted to this <laughs> pulpit. So listen again. The grieving has gone from loneliness to, to anger to now. Now he's just asking question after question to God, mocking him basically. Listen to the message translation of, of what we just read. It's more of, more of a thought for thought than a word for what word. And the message translation is like this. It says, I call to you, God. All day I call. I wring my hands. I plead for help. Are the dead a live audience for your miracles? Do ghosts ever join the choirs that praise you? Does your love make any difference in a graveyard? Is your faithful presence noticed in the corridors of hell? Are your marvelous wonders ever seen in the dark? Your righteous ways noticed in the land of, of no memory. My goodness. You see what I mean? Watch out for the lightning. Like if I ever talk to my parents that way, whoo, be rough. Yet, the psalmist is coming before God Almighty in all his anger and his loneliness and his grief. And he's unloading. Verses like this are not commanding you to go to God that way. But it's giving you permission to be real, to be a real, raw human being. Maybe you've developed this theology that doesn't allow you to present yourself before God that way. And that, that's how I was taught growing up. You can't be mad at God. Don't be angry with God. And then you read the Bible and you're like, well, there's a lot of people angry with God. And he just stands there as a good father. And he says, I'm here for it. Like, that's what's crazy, right? When my little girl, Ella, when she gets mad at me, I don't take it personally. In fact, I look at her and I'm like, that's kind of cute sometimes. But she's got, she's a little girl. She's got big emotions. And when she gets angry with me, I, I don't somehow feel as if I'm not enough. I know that this five-year-old girl is just incapable of processing hard moments. She'll get there. Guys, when God looks at you in your anger and you cry out to him, he's not offended that he has somehow disappointed you. He just, he's full. He's complete. He doesn't, he's not looking for you to validate him, right? Like he doesn't get more complete the more that you love him. He's looking at you and saying, my child, it's okay. Let it out. You can be angry. I'm here for it. I'm not scared. I'm not going away. You're not going to run me off. I'm here for it. That's what we see in this psalm. We need to approach God not with our best performance, not with our best clothes, not with our best smile. Just approach Him honestly. There's a movie that came out in 1980 called Ordinary People. And it was about really this picture perfect family um, who had everything you could want, right? But early in the movie, one of the sons um, dies in a boating accident named Buck. And the rest of the movie is really about how this family processes and grieves the loss of this, this boy. And eventually the, the husband, though he didn't want to talk about it initially, begins to open up and begins to process his grief. And at the very end of the movie, his wife walks in, Beth, and he's at the kitchen crying, kitchen table crying. And she says, why, why are you crying? And he says, Beth, you're beautiful and you're unpredictable, but you're so cautious. It would be all right if, if there hadn't been any mess, but you can't handle mess. You need everything neat and easy. When Buck died, he said, it was as if you buried all your love with him. And I don't understand that. And it's just this moment of him finally being honest. And her, I think, internalizing that. She walks away. She goes upstairs. She breaks down for a minute, regains her composure, as if she can be tougher than the situation. She packs her bags, and she leaves. And the marriage is over, and the scene ends. If we don't allow our grief to come to the presence of the Lord. That is how we'll deal with it. We'll develop man-made strategies, we'll build walls around our hearts, and we'll live in prison. Another example, in 1861, Prince Albert died. Queen Victoria was left as a widow for the rest of her life, 42 years, I think. She made sure Prince Albert's linens were changed, clothes were laid out every day, clean water was ready for him to shave. He'd been dead for 40 years and she was still doing it. You and I know that's unhealthy. But we also know grief does crazy things. 
listen, if we're going to take grief and try to develop these methods of coping, it's in a way mocking God, as if to say, no, I can handle it. I'll process it my own way. Thank you very much. I'll put a Band-Aid on what needs surgery. And God's sitting here saying, no, let it out. Like, I'm big enough. Let it drive you into my presence. Let's let truth and pain unite. That's where we'll find hope. So the psalmist continues. We'll finish this out, all right? He says, as he transitions, I, I call to you for help, verse 13. All right? He just gets done with all these questions, and then this another like, kind of moment of honesty, just pure sad expression. I, I call to you for help, Lord, in the morning. My prayer meets you. And then another couple questions, but the tone has changed. Verse 14, Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? The tone has changed. He's no longer mocking God. It's as if he has come to the end of himself, right? There's this moment of just despair. Um, the, the, the grief and the anger, the loneliness has just kind of come to this moment of emptiness. I don't know what else to do. There was, uh, you remember the show um, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Bel -Air? I used to watch that show a lot. Um, I don't care how tough you are. There's a scene in that show that will make a grown man cry. It was when Will's biological dad came and visited and um, he, he was basically like promising Will all these things, right? Oh, I gotta stay here, I gotta stay here. And um, you know, the episode revolves around Will's dad promising to hang out with him and then to take him on a trip. And so uh, toward the end of the episode, Will comes out with his bags packed, ready to go on this trip with his dad and his dad makes this excuse about how he has to leave, right? So he walks out and initially Will, you can see his disappointment and, and he tries to play it off like it's, it's whatever, man. I got other, other things to do anyways. You know, I, I, got, I, got, I got to go here anyways. And then Uncle Phil says, Will, it's okay to be angry. But then Will gets mad. Like he gets mad pretending he's not mad. Right? He says, I don't need him anyways. I don't need him. I learned how to play ball without him. I learned how to talk to girls without him. I don't need that man. And he goes on a tirade and he's yelling. And then he, see, it's emotional. I'm just picturing it. He comes to the end of all of it, and he just gets quiet. And he starts crying, right, on camera and on, in this scene. And then he looks at Uncle Phil, and he says, why doesn't he want me, man? And Uncle Phil just gives him a big hug. And the scene ends, right? And you watched Will in 60 seconds go from dismissing it, anger, the end of himself. Why? And that's where we're at in this psalm. We've worked through a lot of that hard stuff. You've gotten to this point where he's just like, why, God? Why have you rejected me? And the psalm ends, darkness is my only friend. That's where we've come to. So I think really the last emotion within grief we see in the text here is depression. Depression is a paralyzing emotion. And I could give you facts all day long. My guess is several of us have experienced it. Um, and if I could be honest with you enough, I've, I have wrestled with depression my entire adult life, and, uh, which might be shocking to hear because I'm, I mean, I'm an extroverted, a highly extroverted person. So most of what you see of me is, is uh, happiness and energy, you know, energy. My favorite place in the world is that lobby, talking to you guys. Um, but man, yeah, sadness has, has kind of haunted me for most of my adult life. And so I, I get it. It's hard. Um, when you look at statistics, you can find that every, every single age group in America, uh, depression is up. There was a study done in 2018, before COVID, 41 million Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, health carriers, they took those records and they looked at depression rates, and depression is up in every age category. Um, specifically, teens and young adults have the highest depression rates right now. And so what we're, what we're like, literally, we're watching this grand experiment unfold in front of us. Um, we, we think we're getting advanced as a society and all of these technological pursuits and luxuries are leading to a better life, but it's actually leading us to a worse life. Isn't that crazy? We think we're solving the world's problems where we're actually creating more problems. Specifically, the mental health of, of all of us is deteriorating in some way. That's an epidemic. And if we're trying to fix it with the very things that are causing it, we're just going to be on a cycle. So church, we need to come back to places like Psalm 88. We need to come back to the truths of God. We need to come to the feet of the Father and just be honest. You don't need to pretend anymore. Psalm 88 ends on this dark note. But Psalm 88 is not the end of the Bible, right? 
The Bible ends with resurrection. It ends with hope. It ends with new life. It ends with all things made new. What's interesting about the Psalms in general is I've, I mentioned week one that's divided into five books. The ratio of lament psalms to praise psalms in books one, two, and three is over two to one. Heavy on lament. Books two, or excuse me, books four and five of the Psalter, it's reversed. Two to one, praise to lament. It's just giving you this subtle reminder. Hey, it's coming. All things made new, it's coming. The reason all the movies we watch and all the shows that we watch end with hope and victory is because the writer of all those things has within their soul this longing for all things made new, this longing for victory, this longing for hope, this longing for resurrection. All of those, uh, all of those things are just hinting to life in Jesus, and we can find it in Him. There is hope. Psalm 88 is dark, and you need that sometimes to be reminded that life is not a movie. But ultimately, friends, we get to rest in the reality that resurrection awaits, and we can celebrate that together. I'll end with this. We want to be a church that celebrates together, and we want to be a church that mourns together. We want to be a church that bears one another's burdens, and we want to be a church that shows up uh, and parties with one another, right, in healthy, godly ways. Um, but, but we're going to be both of those things. Why? Because we're family, like Jay said. And um, family can be deeper than blood. And so... I pray that as we move forward, um, even with a heaviness like this, that we would be able to say, um, man, I'm, I'm here for it because life is, life is hard and we want to do it together and we want to do it in Christ. All right, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that, Lord, you are a God who understands and you don't just understand because you're all-knowing, but you, you've experienced it and you've stepped into it. God, the loneliness that we feel is... Is not even close to the loneliness that you felt and you overcame. And you did not give in to the temptation to criticize and to blame and to accuse. Rather, you absorbed it and, and killed and put it to death on the cross. So that when we fall short in those categories and we lash out in anger and blame, we know that, God, you paid for that sin because you overcame it. And Father, we're so grateful. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to transform hearts, that you would uh, cultivate a people here that are deeply rooted in you, and that every emotion that we experience as human beings can be brought before your feet. And we can know, Lord, that, that we're not running you off, but Lord, you're bringing us deeper into who you are. You're healing and you're making all things new. And for that, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.